I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Welcome to Campfire Talk, everyone. This is where we sit around the campfire, put our feet up, and have a cold drink and just let the conversation flow. Uh, with Chuck and Forrest today, Brian is joining us. Brian, would you like to tell everyone about your podcast uh, sure. Uh, I co-host the Transatlantic History Ramblings podcast, which I know is quite a mouthful, but we discuss anything and everything in history from the medieval times to current times to true crime to paranormal and Bigfoots to celebrities and directors and producers and writers and actors. And, and William's been on a couple times and yeah, it's a fun show. Really, really Cop enjoy talks you guys. And every time we talk, the foots. <laughs> oh, the, the 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 email box blows up any time we talk foots, <laughs> as I call it. He, he cracks me up, guys. Brian, tell him what you always say about me on these shows. <laughs> I say, first off, I don't like bringing him on because he's got a better voice than me, because he is the ultimate smooth jazz DJ <laughs> voice. <laughs> <laughs> that always kills me and i could listen to william jevning read the phone book and you know that whole asmr thing i mean that is william jevning he is mr smooth jazz <laughs> <laughs> forrest you and i were talking uh about i guess it was the whole you know bigfoot eating people subject and and you brought up a couple good points uh, things that happened in Kentucky, and I think one of those was fairly recent. If you want to uh, maybe tell us, you know, what we were chatting about, tell the guys about that. Well, uh, first off, I <clears throat> shouldn't take credit for uh, thinking about this because, I mean, uh, the issue with the Kentucky, I mean, I have actually thought about it on several occasions, but uh, after we had discussed that on the podcast, there was an there was one of our uh, viewers that uh, or listeners, excuse me, uh, that had suggested that somebody uh, discuss the situation in Kentucky. Now, I believe, if I remember correctly, and I probably should have uh, uh, looked all this up, but um, this the one first situation I'm gonna uh, the the most recent, I should say, happened. Uh, it was involving too too many horses, and I think the other horse was a regular size horse. <clears throat> a gentleman went out, uh, went to bed, fed them, went to bed. They were absolutely fine. When he got up the next morning, their throats were ripped out, and all three of them were uh, deceased. Well, of course, he called uh, the sheriff's department, and uh, he got a variety of uh, people out there, including uh, Parks and Wildlife and uh, uh, some other people that uh, I don't think he ever knew who they were, but uh, everybody involved was asking asking questions about uh, what had transpired, and uh, it was evident that it was not, uh, they didn't have their throats slit by a knife, so a human hadn't done it, and he couldn't have imagined why anybody he didn't have any enemies. Why anybody would have just gone out there and, and uh, done that to his animals? Well, come to find out after they got to uh, doing a little investigation and asking around, there had been two dogs that uh, just, I mean, I guess not too far away from this location. I mean, just houses down in this little small community that had, uh, been killed as well overnight in that same in much the same manner as the horses had so oh, wait a minute um, now i you know i got stopped early on when now this is on private property right yes uh-huh so your yeah, animals are it's, killed it's, 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 why in the world would parks and recreation come out to a, a situation like that 
I mean, that's, well, that's kind of outside of their that yeah, that's kind of outside of their uh, area of responsibility. Well, I kind of uh, thought that too, and I didn't, I didn't know, and I don't think there was ever really a uh, a valid explanation given. And I mean, if somebody out there in the the audience knows what exactly transpired while they were called in, I do know that somebody had said, "Oh, that must be a big cat. A big cat did it." Well, first off, big cats. Yeah, they'll they'll kill and they go for the throat, but they go for a suffocating bite and they don't rip the throats out and uh, they suffocate to spray, bring them down and they start feeding on them. They're not going to they don't joy kill. Now, canines do joy kill. Uh, We all know that dogs will go through and and decimate herds of uh, sheep and goats and and even small uh, livestock such as calves. But big cats don't do that. So. that kind of got thrown out real quick. And I, I thought that was kind of strange too. So if somebody out there knows why the parks and wildlife people got called in, but here's the high strangeness of it. The sheriff actually said, maybe it was a Bigfoot. Now, why would the sheriff, I'm, I'm thinking there had to have been something else, some kind of evidence that would have led a law enforcement official, official to have, stuck his neck out and said such as that yeah i was going to say that's kind of going out on a limb there professionally to make a comment like that that is your first assumption yeah you know that so, makes me wonder if maybe he called the sheriff first and the sheriff sent parks and recreations thinking yeah. that hey this was something outside it was the bigfoots yeah, I don't, the, the owner of the animals didn't call Parks and Wildlife, it's, it's my understanding. Uh, I read about this a long time. It's been about a year, year and a half ago that this happened. And um, uh, I think that uh, the, as far as I know, the owner just had called the sheriff because he just didn't know what to make of the situation. They were quite upset over these horses. And I mean, I would be too. I mean... I own horses, and I would be very upset. I get distraught even when my horses <laughs> die of old age. But, uh, you know, to have go out and find three of them dead with their throats ripped out, I mean, that's that's quite disturbing. My question is, did were, they just rip the throats out? They didn't eat them or drag them no, or just no, – so just, it was just they like were, they were being a jerk? Yeah, yeah. That's why I said that, you know, when the Parks and Wildlife said that, uh, oh, it must maybe it was a big cat or something like that. Well, then they and then they go back to the thing. Well, wait a minute. Y'all are always saying that there's no such thing as cougars in, in Kentucky. So how could this have been a big cat? Well, big cats don't kill like that. Uh, they just don't do that. I mean, they go in, they and they make a kill, they, they make a suffocating kill, and they strangle. Yeah, you know, they strangle them. They suffocate them and take them down, and um, then they're gonna either drag them off and eat them or they're going to uh, consume them right, right there. They're not going to uh, just go around and thrill kill three horses and then go, then go down the road and kill a couple of dogs. So uh, it didn't make any sense whatsoever. Chuck, you ever hear of anything like that? <clears throat> yeah, I remember when that, when that happened, I think, you know, like Forrest was saying, it, it was uh, about a year ago when, when all this took, took place and i know there was a lot of suspicion from from people that they even thought it could have been a dog man that did all that yeah yeah that did come up too and the and the viewers and comments that they had uh, may had made the comment that it, maybe it was a dog man and which ties into the other story uh in kentucky that's been i think it's probably been uh chuck you know what i'm talking about it's been what about three years ago the, the, yeah, the little so. yeah right yeah and that was i mean that was a horrible situation uh for the parents uh to the little boy came home from school and i mean i didn't mean to jump into that story too but i guess we can tie all this in together but um the little boy came home from school and he he wasn't a uh he was 13 years old it was my understanding uh but he was not a uh he was a little on the small side for a 13 year old and that was the first thing that they had, uh, the comment, I remember that uh, law enforcement had said that the child was on the small side for a 13 year old, but um, he came home from school and where they ended up finding the little boy, the, when the parents came home, um, 
they couldn't find him. And they ended up calling out search and rescue, and, and they had a big search team out there looking for him. And this house had a fenced-in backyard, and then it, right behind it, I guess the way I understood it, and I've never seen pictures of the place, but the way they, they described it and I understood it, they had a large uh, hill, and it was sort of a steep, kind of like a cliff-like hill right behind their property that came right up to their fence line. And where they found this child was up on this, the the side of this cliff, and he'd been killed, I mean, horribly uh, mangled and, and fed on. And <clears throat> the thing about it is, is, I mean, you know that you can look at bite marks and tell pretty much what possibly could have killed them. I mean, bears have distinctive uh, teeth marks, and so do uh, big cats, and uh, so do wolves. Well, you know, again, we go back to the thing. Nobody, as somebody suggested, it was a big cat. Then that got discounted because they didn't find anything. And the other thing is, too, you know damn well that they had, if anything like that fed on that child, that saliva, they could have retrieved DNA. Not anything was ever said about uh, what they had found or whether there had been testing done for DNA. And they even had law enforcement at one point in time, and this got hushed up real quick. Somebody said that for it appeared that whatever it w- was came in the house and got him and drug him out. Now, that puts a whole new spin on the thing. So, uh, you know, was he... Did it get in the backyard? Did it chase him in the house and catch him before he actually got any, uh, you know, got into the house and got the door closed? I don't know because that whole little story got squashed real quick. And uh, then again, somebody in law enforcement there that was never identified was saying uh, maybe it was a Bigfoot, maybe it was a dog man. I mean, if I was the mother of that child, I'd want to know real quick what had uh, killed my child. Yeah, it almost makes you wonder if they were, somebody quieted that situation down because a parent normally would raise a lot of hell. Well, I don't think there's any question as to uh, that's probably exactly what happened. I mean, it seems like when these peculiar things happen, that they just, if they don't have a ready explanation immediately, then it all gets uh, swept under the rug or get some, let's blame it on this or let's blame it on that. And uh, nobody ever actually gets a definitive answer out of the whole subject. You know, when you look at like missing people cases, there seems to be kind of a commonality among all of those situations, not in terms of how they disappear or those details, but the responses and how they're handled afterwards. And, and the common one, and I understand this, you know, with law enforcement agencies, is they're, they have limited resources, and, and but usually it's the same thing over and over and over and over again. You know, limited, respo- limited res- resources, limited information, limited funding, uh, so that, you know, the net result is there's nothing really done about missing people yeah well you know, also oh i'm sorry go ahead no 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 i was just gonna i was just gonna concur with that because i know we've had a couple of cases where people have come up missing and then uh three or four years later they find pieces or parts of a body and nothing is ever i mean and i i can think of an incident where a young girl out in east texas disappeared under very mysterious circumstances where you you have the typical situation where she was running and she was on the phone. Uh, It almost reminded me of Colin Finnerty was on the phone uh, and she was calling and saying that somebody uh, was chasing her. And, uh, you know, they recently, uh, all they found of her uh, here just uh, this, this year was, uh, or not in 23, but 2022 uh, was her skull. And of course there's no answer as to, uh, I never heard a thing as to how she died, and and who knows if we'll ever know how she died. But I mean, she was on the phone with both uh, law enforcement and with her mother, 
you know, and she left her she left her vehicle. You know, these you always hear about these strange things about people getting out of their vehicle and running. I mean, like, why in the world would you do that unless you had some sort of a presence there at the car that would force you to do such? Right. You know. You know, and it's interesting that, and granted, the majority of missing people are people who just decide themselves to go off the grid or for whatever reason, right? But there are these strange ones, and we were in we were in Oregon this past summer doing uh, some field work. And one of the things you notice about the particular area we were at is there's a, a large, an inordinate, inordinately large number of missing people in that area. And again, granted, some people just go off the grid, uh, but there are strange ones. And one of the strange ones at that particular time, I think it happened a week or two before we went there, um, and there was a local gentleman who was with his vehicle at the end of his driveway. Uh, no enemies, anything like that. And he, he vanished with the vehicle sitting there. No explanation. And, you know, what do you see about these things? Well, there's, you know, posters put up around the, the community, you know, to call law enforcement if they have any information. And that's as far as they ever go. Those things just kind of go away. Yeah, yeah. see, my, my thought with this kid. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Oh. Yeah, maybe it's because I'm I'm more of a city person, but you know if there's evidence that someone was in the ho- someone or something was in the house, <clears throat> pursued him, maybe took him out, you'd think the police would investigate that as a crime scene, a homicide almost, and then the damage to the body could be as a result of you know animals attacking after the body was disposed of. But you know that would be my first go to in law enforcement. If there's evidence someone or something was in the house, then the kid was found up on the cliff dead. I, I would think it. I would think crime scene more than anything. Well, you would think that. Uh, see, he was actually found that evening. It wasn't like he was found two or three days later. He was actually found that evening. So whatever had gotten him, just in those few hours, had had time to uh, mangle him and uh, maim him, and then feed on him. And so I, that I mean that right there is pretty damn scary. And I know people would ask the question, you know, would a Sasquatch do that? <laughs> well, let me give you an example. Um, when we were investigating the whole Yakult Washington thing back in 1989, uh, there were incidents that happened in those areas that were kind of very similar. I mean, uh, the one creature that was seen um, had come back many, many times. And so did others of that group. But this one particular evening, uh, you know, they had a, uh, the family had a 15-year-old daughter. Yeah. And she had a friend come over to spend the, the evening. The rest of the family had gone into Vancouver to, to see a movie. So they were home alone, and, and they decided to uh, go out and, and see the horse, because they had a horse. Uh, now, these were, you know, city people from Wisconsin, and they bought 13 acres and, and moved to this part of Washington State. And, uh, and the 16 year old boy, Nick had had, had the first encounter just, a oh, I, I want to say a couple, two, three weeks before this happened, but they went out to the barn, which wasn't that far from the house. They had a big light out there, big, you know, one of these outdoor like corral lights. And they went into the shed to get some grain for the horse. Well, the horse wasn't anywhere to be seen and they thought they heard it coming from the darkness. And what approached the the light was not a horse. It was this creature. And the girls, you know, of course, dropped the can, run like heck for the house, screaming. It followed them. And they end up tor- tearing the screen door off its hinges, getting into the house in such a hurry. And the creature came right up to the house and was staring in the windows at the two girls. And they were grabbing pots and pans, making as much noise as they could, trying to scare it off. And it didn't scare it off. Uh, eventually, it just they said kind of got a bored look on his face and, and left. But what that shows, and, and I you know, know plenty of other examples that are very similar to that, where the creatures will either pursue people into the house or um, come right up to it. And Forrest, in your case, one actually came in the house. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think Brian knows about that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and I was just going to say, you know, people ask me. Oh. 
What's that, Brian? You broke up a little there. Well, I, I know how to deal with a tweaking crackhead. I, I don't know how to deal with the Bigfoot's coming in my house. Well, it, it, trust me, I, I wasn't real, uh, you know, I, I, ne- I did not see it. So uh, my assumption was that it was a Bigfoot because of the, the lingering smell and then what had happened to me. I got hit in the head with a can of beans, if you can imagine. And I literally, and, and I think when I first told you the story, Will, and, and Chuck's heard the story too, I made the comment that when I came to, it wasn't when I wake, woke up, it was like when I came to. And, and of course, a lot of, um, uh, I'd had people ask me, well, why didn't you wake up when you have heard it, you know, when it pushed the door in and everything, because it was evidence later that I saw on my front door, because I, when I, I, I sat up and I, uh, after I, I wiped my hand across my forehead and I uh, had just enough light in the coming through the window from the pole light outside that I could see something dark on my hand. And uh, that's when uh, I reached over and I, I got, I didn't know, it didn't register on me that it was blood at first. And uh, I had gotten a, a Kleenex or something and wiped my head. And then I reached over and turned the light on. And that's when I saw that it was blood. Well, in the meantime, when I sat up, this can of beans had rolled down. And I, I, I don't know why. I guess I was just in a, a kind of uh, weird state of mind. And I picked the cans up and can of beans up and just set it on my nightstand there. Like, okay. And um, I, I should have questioned what the heck was a can of beans doing on my pillow <laughs> next to my head. But anyway, you know, I didn't think of it, and I didn't even realize it until the next morning when I picked up the can of beans and saw the blood on the can of beans. I was like, I put two and two together. Well, I used to go to bed. This was when I was in my cabin, and I'd already had a previous situation uh, of two or three months previous when one had actually come up to the window and was messing with my air conditioner. And that's a whole other story in itself. But, uh, um, you know, I used to go to sleep with my uh, earbuds in, and I would listen to podcasts uh, on the on my my telephone and because <clears throat> I didn't have a TV and uh, such out there. Well, I had a TV, but I only used it for, uh, you know, DVDs and such as that. I didn't have it hooked up to anything. So I would go to bed listening to that. So I had that those uh, earbuds in my ears and I didn't hear anything. And evidently it had actually pushed the, the uh, door open and busted the frame and the, the, the wall there where the dead bo- uh, boat was and come in. And that was the first thing that I, that I noticed when I was, I sat up and I was like, what is that horrible smell in here? And of course I told Tom, I said, it smelled real. You remember when I said, uh, it <laughs> <laughs> well, it smelled real urine Well, Tom pops off and he says, well, did you not change the cat litter box? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> that wasn't the situation. So, uh, and, and, it, and it had a, 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 pungent, a, a pungent smell, too. It was not just the urine. So I was, I was very off-put by that. And when I saw the door, I think it just all kind of, uh, you know, came full circle. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And I mean, I piled stuff up in front of the door because, uh, I, of course, I couldn't lock the door. I had to put a whole new door lock and everything on the door. And uh, so I had to pile stuff up in front of the door. I was It, it scared me. I mean, uh, this one thing being outside, it's an entirely another thing when they come in. And I'm, I'm going to say something here, too, Will. And Chuck and I discussed this the other night. And, um, you know, we talk about Bigfoot that... All of us had agreed the other other night when we were talking that it seems like something has changed. Mm-hmm. That the whole atmosphere has kind of changed with Bigfoot. They're doing. And I'm different. not talking about just because everybody. Yeah, they're doing. Yeah, they're doing different I, I'm things. I'm not talking about. Yeah, that they're just uh, uh, you know a lot more sightings and everything because we accept that fact that there seem to be a lot more si- uh, sightings, and that could be just the fact that there are more people out there doing things than there were. Say 20, 30, except, 40 years ago. Except well, the, the large number of juveniles now. Yes. Well, I'm that what I was, the point I was trying to make is I think what we have had happen, and I may be right, I may be wrong, I don't know. But we have 
you know, cycle through some of these older Bigfoot mm-hmm. that were more apprehensive, more fearful of uh, humans, say 30, 40. We don't know what their life cycle is, uh, but I'm giving and giving them credit for being at least 50, 60 years old like a, <clears throat> most of your great apes go And that's to. probably accurate. Uh, yeah. And so what you have ha- have happened is that uh, you've got these older ones that have cycled out, and there may not be an alpha male out there that's of a like mind like those were. You know, stay away from humans. Let's avoid them. Mm-hmm. And now you've got these juveniles that are coming into power that are used to seeing humans they're probably used to interacting more with humans and they're probably responsible for a lot of the mischievous stuff that was going on throughout the years they're not as afraid as they they used to be they don't have the fear of us that uh, the others did well you know we've talked about that you know i've tom and i've discussed this many times where you know up until when you think about it up until about the 1970s we we had we had very specific things that we did, and it's unfortunate that we, you know we would go out and shoot at just about any kind of animal out there, but it was a fact of life. It's what happened. Um, but since we stopped doing that, a lot of wildlife is coming in much closer. All wildlife is coming in closer. In fact, they're having problems with cougars and coyotes and stuff like that with children and and people. So it goes without saying that these things are going to do or follow suit they're going to come in because there isn't the threat or the the um implicit threat by humans that there once was and like you said the older generations you know they knew that threat there was a boundary you know they sort of maintained uh their behaviors according to that boundary and now the boundary has gone so that the newer generation isn't aware of that so they're doing what they did maybe 150 200 years ago Yeah. I guess I, I got to go back and ask Forrest a question. This may be because I grew up listening to Larry King interviews, but uh, what kind of beans were they? <laughs> I think they were pinto beans, but I don't remember. <laughs> maybe they were upset that you had the wrong kind of beans, Forrest. <laughs> well, maybe that. And then the, plus the fact that I didn't leave the darn can opener out for them. You know? <laughs> See? Yeah. She, did, she didn't have no cornbread. She had, oh, she had it coming to her. Oh, that's, that's right. See? That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> she had no cornbread. That's why. We all know no barbecue. <laughs> Bigfoot like baked beans because they're the musical fruit. Oh. Now, does that go back to the odor in the cabin? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, guys. <laughs> I'm just saying. No. Just saying. <laughs> you know. You know the common denominator to all of this is, and I and I think you, we know this and we've seen it forever is that you have these places where this kind of stuff happens. Uh, you look at land between the lakes, you look at um, Brown Springs, Oklahoma, Texas border where people get killed and you hear about it and people know about it. But as far as what caused it or as far as w- w- what actually happened, all that stuff gets shoved under the rug. It does. And, and I, I don't know why um, th- they won't come out with, well, this is what happened. This is where it happened. This is how it happened. I don't know why that never <laughs> comes forward uh, to help protect society of of these kind of events. You know, Chuck, I was, and, I was and, looking for people, and you know, because we, we were all kind of working on this looking for family members of someone who went missing, especially under strange circumstances, that might postulate to us that, you know, they think that it's possible that a Sasquatch did this. And it's been absolutely silent. I've run ads all up and down the West Coast. I've contacted and had very good interactions with people who run missing people organizations. You know, they've talked around nothing. But I was also told through one of my, my sources that you know when they they know when those situations happen they go in to those family members and and you know make the situation so that they do not talk at all about it and i have to wonder right. because it's so i mean you would think if if somebody out there 
you know, out of all the people that have disappeared, somebody might think, oh, yeah, it's possible Bigfoot did it. I mean, regardless of what their outlook is, you know, they may think, yeah, it's possible. <laughs> but no one has come forward at all. Well, I know in the in the tribal complex here in this area, uh, I've been out there and talked to them for m- many, many times. And they used to show me pictures, old photographs of the schools and that had that had kids on these pictures and uh, they would point to one of the kids. Well, this kid disappeared. Well, this kid disappeared. And uh, supposedly, I mean, they had hundreds of accounts of, of women and children that were that disappeared. And um, you can't you can't get them to talk about that stuff. You know, when I wrote my book, Haunted Valley, now the name Yakhold is a Native American word, and it means haunted valley. And around, I can't remember the exact year offhand, it was around 1900, uh, one of the stories goes in that area that there was a group of children out picking berries and they all vanished. And the implication was it was one of these creatures or more that, that took all those kids. Hmm. You know, it's interesting. I uh, I did a show probably a couple of years ago with a paranormal researcher from the UK who was talking about cryptid sightings. And a lot of these little villages and towns in the UK, they don't want it going out in the public. They don't want it hitting the media. They don't want it because camera crews from all over in the Discovery Channel and the History Channel and all these places show up and all the cryptid hunter scam tv shows show up and it just becomes a media frenzy and just puts a target on them and it kind of destroys their little villages for a while yeah not that that's moral well so many of those places over there in the uk depend on the tourist industry and i mean uh you don't want the the your tourist industry destroyed because who's going to want to come? I mean, yeah, you might have some weirdos that, you know, like us that go out there and say, Oh, let's go look for the, you know, the, the Bigfoot that's uh, doing this. But, uh, uh, but as far as the standard tourists, they're not going to show up. They're not going to want to be involved in something like that. Yeah. And it makes their town, um, you know, for lack of a better term, it becomes wackadoo land. Well, we're probably familiar with that, huh, Will? We're all been- <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's for sure. That you know, and, and it's. I'm really glad on on Facebook. There's a gr- group out there. Uh, Darren Lee, he as the admin created the po- uh, page, and it's called Bigfoot Hoaxers 2.0, and and they sort <laughs> of and it's good if you if you go on there and look, they they do a good job of really kind of highlighting some of the scams out there. And and I, I I can't disagree with anything they put up there so far, <laughs> <laughs> because too many people in this business say they've tried to get away with nonsense. And it's something Tom and I were talking about just before, and, and Tom's was going to be with us today, but he's got stuff he's doing. So um, when he when he's able to, he'll rejoin us. But he's been really busy. But um, we were talking about how. Uh, you know, there needs to be like a lot more of those pages. People don't want to talk about things that happen to them or happen to family members. Oftentimes, you know, they'll, something will happen. And I get this so many times from witnesses who contact me. Um, they, they went online and they looked through all the people in the topic. And there's so much junk out there. And a lot of times people fall victim to those individuals. Um, but they're reticent to talk about their, you know, what happened to them because of all this stuff. They think that everybody in the subject are nuts. And so it creates this image and then it bleeds over to communities and, you know, where there's such a, a bad taste in people's mouths. They don't want to hear the word Bigfoot. Well, I thought that example of the conversation that you had with my daughter two weeks ago, I mean, when I was actually on the phone with Tom when she had called me and I had, you know, uh, had kind of discounted it, although I'll call her back later. Well, then uh, probably 15, 20 minutes later, she calls me again. Well, I hadn't, she'd actually sent me a text 
and uh, I hadn't even noticed the text. Well, until she called the second time, and I told that's when I told Tom he better hold on, hold on. Maybe something was wrong. I needed to get a hold of her, you know. And that's when I just happened to glance at the text, and I uh, she says, "Well, Mama, I always thought you were kind of crazy about this Bigfoot thing, but well, not really crazy, crazy." And and then, <laughs> and then I see the next and the next question. She's sending me these pictures, and she says. Is this Bigfoot and Big Bowl? Traction, and, she had tracks and, in her yard. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and and it was kind of like all of a sudden her whole attitude has changed. You know, she was. I mean, they were all willing to just kind of laugh and giggle and think, "Oh, okay, well, this makes Mom happy. Okay, fine. Okay, Mom, you just go right ahead and do that." But then when all of a sudden she's got it right there in front of her face, <laughs> it's entirely a different story. And what did you tell her, Chuck? <laughs> oh, I, she doesn't like me anymore because I told her, welcome to the club. <laughs> well, I was thinking, I wasn't going to say it, but I thought it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny w- yeah. when you have somebody like that. I had some friends years ago, and this was, again, at the Alcol location. Um, two of my two of my <clears> good <throat> friends, uh, Don and Carol were their names. And, and Carol, of course, she was very interested in Bigfoot is how they got involved with me doing this stuff. And Don um, was her other half, and he didn't believe in the subject at all. And but he was, you know, it was, was a good sport. He he, you know, helped out, pitched in, did everything. Uh, but you know, he didn't. And only once in a great while, he'd say, "Well, you know, I, I don't really believe in any of this." Until I went out there one evening, and what had happened was that usually we wouldn't be on on the Goldhammer property. We'd be out on the road or somewhere close by, and, and just monitoring what's going on in the area so they got out there a couple hours before i did one day and when i got there don come over to me and and he's you know he's an architect very professional guy and he looked at me he says will he says carol and i were sitting in the car just talking she went she reached in the back to grab us a couple of sandwiches out of the cooler and while she was turned around this thing come walking out across the road in front of our car he says, I didn't believe it, but there it was. <laughs> he says, you know, I got involved in this because of Carol. I thought I would never see anything. He says, but boy, was I wrong. <laughs> I said, well, welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, what else do you say, though, guys? I mean, you know, it's like, welcome to the club. You know, if you've seen one, well, yeah. here you are. Well, I think... Me as a skeptic, a lifelong skeptic of, of, of everything, who loves the weird, the wild, the paranormal, but has always been skeptical of everything. Will is the only one I'll have on my show to talk about this because, let's face it, most of what is portrayed in the media or television or pop culture these days is serious study of this topic is buffoonery. It's it's comical, and it's easy to mock and make fun of and ridicule, and there's very few people, in my opinion, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on the show, but as credible as Will, and and he hates the buffoons as much as I do. (laughs) Well, I had a friend that used to write for a a publication called Skeptical Inquirer. Mike Dennett was his name, and and I'm really sad that Mike's gone now because he had a really sharp mind. And uh, and he, you know, would out people who were hoaxers in this topic and and have all the have all of his t's crossed and i's dotted when he'd write these articles you know he'd have the expert opinions etc on this stuff so uh mike and i'd be on the phone we we'd be on the phone. i remember one time we were on the phone a couple hours you know having this great conversation in the middle of it he says whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute will how can we agree on everything when we're supposed to be on both sides of the issue and i said we're not on both sides of the issue i'm as big a skeptic as you are <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's people who write for organizations like that um, that aren't skeptics. They might call themselves a skeptic, but they're actually a debunker. And so here's here's the thing between skeptics and debunkers. Skeptics, which are most people, are kind of on the fence, you know. And it doesn't take much to either, you know, tip your interest one direction or the other. You know, if something's fake, they're going to say, okay, it's probably all fake. If they're shown something that's real then they still might be a skeptic, but they're more likely to, to listen to more stuff that's legitimate. Whereas the debunkers, 
you know, their minds are closed. They have no opinion except everything is fake. And they're going to write about why it's fake, whether it's, you know, has any legitimacy or not. And um, I really have no use for those kind of people because uh, you can have somebody that's, you know, this professional debunker, maybe done it for 40 years or more. Um, and I've got a witness that I think is very credible. On the other hand, that had an encounter. Uh, and unfortunately, a public will give them equal weight. And to me, the debunker has no credibility because how can you how can you compare what your opinion is versus what somebody's experience is? There's no comparison. It's oranges and apples, in my view. Well, if somebody's had a sighting and then uh, an, an encounter, and then they tell that story, and then you got somebody that's just a complete uh, that's an armchair, what I call an armchair debunker. It's not like they're out there investigating, researching, and everything else. If they were doing that, then I would be entirely different, but they're not. And then you're telling, basically what you're doing is call, telling everybody that's ever reporting an encounter or a sighting liar. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know. There's a bunch of those in this in this country. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. There's been so many so many sightings. There's There's been a bunch of liars out there. Well, exactly. And I remember, I remember something from, um, it was UFO stuff years ago where someone made the comment that even if just one of those accounts was true, then there is alien life that's coming to the planet Exactly. and, and it only takes one. And the same with this topic, if only one was true, well, then you've got something to deal with out there. And it's something's out there. I, you know, I can't say that it's Bigfoot or Sasquatch. I can't say that it's a, a species of mountain gorilla that we've undiscovered, or not discovered yet, not undiscovered, but that we just haven't found. But there's definitely something. I don't know what it is, so I can't debunk everything. But I sure as hell will call out the frauds and the fakes and point them out as frauds and fakes because you can't do serious scientific study with these people getting in the way of it. So I understand the people who want to go after the, the, the scammers, but to just totally debunk a topic because of scammers is just, I, I don't know. That's like you said, that's just short sighted. It's counterproductive. I mean, if there is something legitimate, then, you know, follow the evidence where, and, and unfortunately in the topic, you have people who call themselves researchers or, and I have to laugh. Sometimes there's so many, people who self label themselves as something in this to for to make to make themselves look important more important than they probably are or should be but um you know they have their own uh what do you want to say i guess their own outlook on the topic so they have their own structured outlook and if a situation is outside of that then they will you know maybe call the situation uh, let's see, I'll give you an example, like the creatures being aggressive towards people and possibly, you know, killing and eating people. There are quite a few people in the subject who will, you know, poo poo that because, you know, they think they're forest people or whatever label they want to put on the creatures instead of looking at the preponderance of evidence that shows what they are and what they do. I mean, yes, there are exceptions, but there's always exceptions with any species of wildlife. Well, and we've discussed before, and I've told you plenty of incidences where uh, uh, chimpanzees do this. And chimpanzees are notorious for uh, attacking people, killing them, and eating them. Um, you know, so I, I don't know why that people would necessarily find it hard to believe that there might be another uh, ape out there that would be doing the same thing. Now, <clears throat> um, I just... It, you know, we had a prime example down here, what you're talking about, uh, hoaxers and such. And that really, and I think I told, may have told y'all about this, uh, about 15 years ago, they had an incident down around San Antonio. Actually, it was out, uh, outside of San Antonio in one of the, the, uh, small towns out there. And, uh, people were calling in to 911 and saying that this thing was, they they actually it had actually stopped traffic on one of the major roads out there, and was dragging a deer carcass across the road. And now you've got multiple people saying, "Okay, we're seeing this thing." 
You know, it's not a man in a ghillie suit. It's not a man in a monkey suit grabbing a deer carcass and dragging it off. Well, a little while later, you have, you have somebody that calls in. They were actually camping out on somebody's. There's big ranches out there, okay? And you can have people, as well I know, camping on your property, and you don't even know they're there. And uh, that's what these people were doing. Now, it was a, a homeless couple, and they had set themselves up a uh, a tent and uh, were living out there on this property. But they did have a cell phone, and they called in to 911 reporting that this thing was, you know, lurking around their camp. And, and this all happened in the same night now, mind you. Uh, so uh, what happens? You know, all these reports go in, and... Uh, nine one and the nine one one operator, you know, they get out there and they 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 finally get some police out there and they're wanting them to come out. And these two, this couple, were absolutely terrified. They're not. I'm not. We're not going out there to get you pictures and this, that, and the other. Uh, you know, that always amazes me how law enforcement like. Would you please get us a picture and send it to us? You know, and 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 uh, would you go make? The, it's almost like they're asking somebody else to do the investigation for them. They don't want to get involved. Well, anyway, then then who shows up uh, about a month later? Well, mm -hmm. our our lovely guy named Dyer, <laughs> and he proceeds to make a film and uh, do all this other stuff, and and he hoaxed all this stuff. Well, it, what it did was it all it turned everything else into a laughing situation. Well, as you see, he was involved in the hoax in the first place. That's where you you start getting these stories that oh he was he was hoaxing all this other stuff just to create a a story. Well, he didn't even show up till like a month or so later, right. and and he just took advantage of the situation. But you have this happen all the time that somebody will then come in later and then hoax something and hope. I guess in hopes that they're going to make a name for themselves. Of course, I think didn't he pull some kind of stuff? He made he a lot of money. Made up his body and put it in a. a, a oh yeah, a, yeah. Put, yeah. He made, he made a ton of money. Showing it around. He made a lot of money and he bought yeah. some expensive and, trucks and a trailer and all this stuff and until he was finally outed at it being a hoax. Yeah. Well, not, not only did he do that in Texas, but he also went. I think. Yeah, I think it was to. He went to Georgia. And did the same thing there. He was, and, and he was part. I think he, that was where he finally. Go ahead. I was going to say, Chuck, wasn't he part of part of that Georgia freezer hoax thing, that Biscardi and some of those guys yeah. were involved in? Yeah, he was. Uh -huh. <clears throat> yes. And there's and uh, that was that was where he finally got caught, and people started to be pretty upset about him. Yeah, he's done. Nobody will look at him anymore. Um, you know, now there's, yeah. there's other reasons people have for coming out and claiming hoaxes too. go, go back to the sixties when, you know, today he's known as the, the admitted hoaxer of footprints in Bluff Creek, Ray Wallace. Well, Ray Wallace was, oh, yeah. Ray Wallace was a contractor in those days in that area. And, and he wasn't out on the sites. He, you know, he would, he would hire these crews to go out and do road building or logging or whatever it was they were contracted for. And when the tracks started being found in that area, when Bob Titmus was in there doing his work before, you know, all these other people come in, I think Green and DeHinden were involved somewhat too. But, um, and I remember, remember the story where Nate DeHinden himself told me this. And uh, he said, Titmus and Wallace, and Wallace was very interested in this and very into it back in those days. There was no hoax claims or anything like that. He was really into this. Um, they were doing, Titmus and Wallace were doing a volumetric test on some scat. And it came out to be, to equal that, that would have come from a 1,200 pound horse. So it was a very large animal. And, and I've seen scat in that area. It's not bear scat. Absolutely not. Just the sheer volume and size. Uh, to this day, but uh, Rene came up and made you know just a flippant comment. He was a young guy, and he was kind of he was kind of ticked that uh, Titmus had been given put in charge of the uh, Pacific Northwest expedition instead of him. But he was only 26 years old, so he was the youngest guy in the group. And I think you know Tom Slick put Titmus in charge because he'd been there more, and he was an older guy, a little more uh, level-headed. So Rene walked up and made the the you know sarcastic remark that oh that's that's horse crap wasn't exactly the word he used but you know and he made it made a big joke about it so nobody looked at scat anymore and then it was after that 
once, you know, guys like DeHandon and Green and Titmus and all those guys who were really the ones getting the attention for doing the work there, that Wallace decided he was going to be, you know, come out and say, well, I, I hoaxed everything. But when you look at all of his carved wooden feet, not one of them match any of the footprints that were found during that decade in that area. So it was more sour grapes, I think, on his part to come out and make that claim to try to take attention away from those people who were actually doing the work. Well, what it Anytime you're dealing you. with fake scat, there's oh. a good time. Oh, it was, it was <laughs> real scat, believe me. <laughs> Go ahead, Forrest. I'm sorry. Oh, and no, I, was, I was just going to say, you know, when you have somebody like that that uh, uh, comes out and does stuff like what Dyer did and, and what uh, uh, Wallace did, that you have uh, what it does is it discounts everything else that uh, was real. And, and people start looking at everything as being, a, a, oh, it was just all part of a big, great big hoax. So, and, and I think that that's what discredits the whole subject entirely. And, and it's a sad situation. I mean, people should always have a healthy skepticism about anything, right. but, uh, you know, a healthy skepticism and then being a hoaxer is an entirely different situation. It is. If if you follow the evidence, you know, it'll lead you to whatever logical conclusion you end up at. Um, it, we've had people like, uh, Bill Munns on the show, <laughs> Bill Munns, you know, worked in Hollywood for many years. He he was a suit maker, you know, for movies. Like, he made the suit for a Swamp Thing for that movie. Um, and he did some work with the Patterson film. Because, you know, there are people... Uh, what's the guy's name who claimed he was wearing the suit in the film? Um, but Bill had a... He had a good perspective, an interesting perspective. He said he thinks, you know, that Patterson was going to make some kind of a documentary film and they were going to do reenactments... So, um, I don't know, I can't think of the guy's name, um, who claims he claims he was in the suit in the film. And what Bill said... Well, it doesn't even are, you th- are you talking about the guy, are you talking about the guy that worked for Disney? Uh, I don't know if he worked for Disney. Um, he, he knew, he says he knew Patterson and Gilman and, and they went, you know, and had him, you know, wear the suit and he has a picture of him wearing a suit, um... Gosh, I... Well, he's not even that tall. No, well, here's the thing that Bill said it, uh, before I... You know, and we, he lives right down the road from, uh, 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 oh, again, Bob Gimlin. Right. What? Well, here's the deal. Bill thinks that, you know, Patterson may have shot some footage with this guy in the suit, whatever suit they had, and then he went and actually got the real thing. So the guy wearing the suit would look at the film of the real creature and think that was himself because he never saw himself in a suit doing anything out there on camera and i thought that's a very interesting perspective because if you had never seen your film footage and you saw that you might think that that was you when it really wasn't Hmm. that is an interesting approach because when bill talked about you know the the joints with a suit an actual suit the joints have to line up with the joints in the suit otherwise in especially 1967 it just wouldn't work um and when you look at what's on that film when they did measurements and things you know the the arms and legs and everything are different than what a, a humans would be so the joints wouldn't line up so it's impossible we did a we did a two-part series on the show with bill munns i can't remember the episodes but if anybody listening uh, if they go on my YouTube page, William Jevning, you can scroll down through the videos and and find parts one and two with Bill Munns. It's it's very uh, uh, very insightful the things very that Bill had to say. Yeah, it's very interesting. Bob Hieronymus. Bob Hieronymus, you're correct. Yes, and I know from talking, you know, from knowing guys like Green and Hendon and Titmus and those guys, I knew all them guys personally. Um. Uh, there weren't, and even to this day, there aren't that many roads bisecting that region. So in those days, especially, you were kind of limited on how you got in there and how you got out of there. And a lot of the people who worked up there, because it was a long commute to go home, they would stay up there for extended time periods. 
and they would camp on the roads. So they would see anybody who was up there, and, and Patterson and Gimlin were there for three weeks. And all those people only said, or said they only saw the two guys during that whole time period. And Bob Herodimus in a monkey suit. <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting too that you know had there had there been a suit that it's it was never produced and I mean there's just and then of course you get crazies like M.K. Davis and his theories but we won't go into that on this one but um, yeah the, yeah I just looked it up it's not like I'm that super genius yeah. <laughs> I looked it up when we were talking and uh, Philip Morris claimed to have created the costume that was used but yet he never created one nearly as close to that for any other project and you, and you have to look money. at the money in those days too you know patterson well, i talked to mrs patterson a number of times she's a she was a character um and she told me flat out that they just didn't have the money i mean patterson and gimlin were construction workers at the time so you know work was hit and miss they didn't have a lot of money and they were in between jobs at that particular time. That's how they were able to go down there and spend three weeks. In fact, Gimlin wanted to get back because he wanted to go back to work. Uh, but it was most often that friends and family would give them 20 or $30 for gas and food to be able to go out and do their outings. And back in 67, that was, that was plenty of money to do that. I mean, I remember, you know, as a kid going out with, uh, you know, our, our family members who would, our friends, a friend of our family's who would take me camping and fishing a lot as a kid. And he, he would spend at Tops. We'd go up to Mount Rainier for a few days and it would be five bucks for food and whatever gas he needed. That was it. Uh, and I know people think, oh, five bucks, that's nothing. Well, back in 1967, you could do a lot of stuff with that amount of money. So, <laughs> you know. Let him buy a gallon gas yeah, now. Yeah. So, I mean, if they if they got 20 or $30, they'd take off to Mount St. Helens for a few days or a week. And in those days, they could do that. And that's what happened. So, But otherwise, you know, to make a suit like that would have been, I think, fairly expensive, even in those times. Yeah, because it was better than the, you know, award-winning costumes from the original Planet of the Apes film, which were groundbreaking at the time. And they were, but... And that suit he made was that much better? Right, when you when you look at those, it's like, nowadays you think, oh, okay, that's that looks pretty hokey, right? <laughs> and I'll tell you something I learned, too. The reason that the apes in those movies wore clothing was because those suits had these big metal fasteners in the back. That's how the, the actors entered the suits, was from the rear. And they couldn't hide those fasteners well enough. I mean, you could try to put hair in things, but they would still show up occasionally. So they decided to put clothes on them. And when you look at the Patterson film, the Patterson film holds up today. You see that looks like something real, and there aren't any fasteners. No, and you know, and I, it might be going kind of backtracking off topic, but earlier Forrest said, you know, primates will attack people chimps have been known to do it you know i have my own experience where i'm not allowed at the gorilla enclosure at the at my local zoo anymore because the male gorilla there wants to kill me uh -oh. and yeah i went, i was there my girlfriend's sitting right here she could be a witness we went there and we're in the gorilla enclosure and he went nuts and he started beating his chest and attacking the glass and swinging his body at it and screeching at me so we left. We joked about it almost for the year. But a year and a half, two years later, I went back, and as soon as I went in, he did the same thing. He recognized me and wanted to kill me. What'd you do to him? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I'm six foot five. I'm a giant guy with you know big, curly, long hair. He must have thought I was a, another male trying to take over his family. Uh oh. <laughs> but she said right here she'll tell you she was scared when he flung his entire body he swang on a vine and swung his entire body feet first at the glass while screaming at me oh my and was beating his chest and the whole nine yards and then a year and a half later he was calm as could be sitting there eating whatever he's eating and saw me and went nuts again you know Forrest that mm -hmm. makes me makes me think about a guy we interviewed uh, in the southeastern part of the country a couple of years ago uh, him and him and two buddies were going fishing and on the small creek and there was a ridge line above them and they heard all this noise this screaming and stuff going on up there and of course they all stopped thinking what the heck is that 
And then this, whatever the source of that noise was, come running down the ridge towards them, screaming the whole way. And then this creature pops out and is within 20 feet of these three guys, just throwing an absolute tantrum, jumping around, screaming and, and, you know, baring its teeth. In fact, they got such a good view if they could see it had missing teeth and things like that. You know, and it was, it was just like a very, like you were talking about, Brian, this, this very uh, gorilla or primate like uh, display in front of them. And then eventually it left. Of course, the guys are in total uh, PTSD mode at this point, but um, you hear about these things that do happen that are very similar to what other yeah, primates Sarah, do. Sarah to this day always says, I didn't think gorillas really beat their chest like in Tarzan movies until I saw that. You know, oh, these yeah, creatures <laughs> these creatures do that too. I actually have a recording of one doing it. It's for freaky. Yeah. Well, we won't discuss chimpanzees. That's that that is my least favorite primate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all about bedtime for Bonzo. I've hated chimps since that movie too. You know, that's and <laughs> well, those movies, those the Hollywood chimps are what everybody thinks of when they think of a chimp. But they have to be specially trained to be like that, don't they, Forrest? Yes, they do. And and the, for the most part, those chimpanzees that they use in those uh, in movies and such are bonobos. And bonobos are notoriously uh, very calm. They're the ones that I tell you that they solve everything with sex. You know, if they have a disagreement in the group, you know, everybody goes and they go into this orgy, a sexual orgy. And I, and you may think that I'm I'm kidding about that but this is the honest to god truth they do and then everybody's happy happy after that and and the, and the disagreement is over with when well, your pan troglodytes your regular chimpanzees do not do that i mean they go around tearing up the forest floor does this sound familiar beating on trees uh mm -hmm. ripping up trees tearing down limbs beating on uh whoever they may be wanting to take their uh aggression out on at the, the time and and then we've seen them he, uh, chase monkeys. I mean, that is absolutely uh, just, I mean, it's distressing for me to even watch uh, when they're hunting because they literally rip their victims apart. They will start feeding on them while they're alive. So when I stop and think about some of these things that happen to you, possibly, let me, let me clarify that, possibly are happening to humans by Bigfoot. And, and I have in the back of my mind this, scenario of having watched what these chimpanzees do i can't even imagine what would possibly be happening to a human being in the arms of a bigfoot i i just wouldn't even want to imagine it, it wouldn't last it, long no you and know, don't even the the trained docile chimps they can turn too i mean what was the story michael oh, yeah. jackson's chimp bubbles just turned one day and attacked him and threw him down the stairs or something oh, the yeah. one that lived with him Yes, I mean they 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 have a very short fuse, and uh, it's it, it, like I say I I got bit by a yearling uh, chimpanzee uh, uh, oh god way too long ago for me even to to, to uh, tell you but I still have the scars on my bicep from uh, from that thing and all because nobody bothered to tell the stupid college student that you shouldn't feed the uh, the lower order. Uh, chimpanzees before you feed the alpha in the group and even when you have yearlings and two-year-olds together you always have a, there's always an alpha in the group whether it be a male or a female and you better be addressing them first and not the other guys and me i was just feeding whoever came up with the the you know i should have recognized the fact that uh, these others were running up wanting the food and they're always and they were watching the other one and it didn't take that one real real quick to you know, realize that oh no this is not what's supposed to be going on and a chomp and i was like i was out of there i was like i, I no, i'm not working with these guys anymore you know <laughs> give me but somebody they're, to so a more cute. they're so yeah. cute when you dress them like people and have them ride a tricycle <laughs> yeah you know well, that's what i talk I have... about when i talk about this kind of artificial construct that we have built around ourselves and that's our view of the world and it's really, it's kind of a disservice to ourselves that we have this false images of nature and, and the creatures in nature. It, it's how we get people calling the, the Sasquatch the forest people. You know, it, if they knew the reality, uh, they probably would never set foot in the forest again. 
Well, you know, Harry and the Hendersons was a great movie. I watched it. I thought it was cute and everything else, but I don't think that uh, that's what Sasquatch is. No, it wasn't quite what Rene was either. He His character was the Frenchman in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Green was the, the little museum curator. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I think in reality, Bigfoot, would, uh, Harry would have eaten John Lithgow's face. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it would not have been a pretty picture. It definitely would have had a higher rating. It, it cracked me up, too, that he hits it with the car and knocks it out. And I'm thinking, okay, well, how would you get it in the car, number one? Um, but <laughs> I, I actually have interviewed well, people. did they load it on the top of the car? I think so, yeah. You know, I, I, I knew a guy years ago, uh, and we've talked about Buddy Fight. He was the uh, the former Hells Angel slash guitar player for Johnny Mathis. But uh, a friend of his and I knew who the guy was, owned a um, gas station slash mechanic shop uh, in that same area, that part of, uh, north of uh, Yakult, a little place called Amboy. And um, he hit one of these things with his Jeep one night. It was foggy, and he hit the thing. It only knocked it down momentarily. It got up and ran off, but it totaled his Jeep. And we kind of chuckled about, you know, what do you tell your insurance company for that that situation? Well, he didn't. He towed it to his shop and uh, and rebuilt it himself, but apparently did quite a job in the Jeep, not so much with the Sasquatch. <laughs> you know, I have a question, if I might, it, you know, if I may be so bold, because I'm not a regular researcher. I'd like to ask Forrest, as an anthropologist, have you seen any signs of, like, cultural anthropology, like, a system of living or a communal living of these creatures. Do, have you found any evidence that looks like a, a hierarchical society? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. I have to base what I, I, I would, my assumptions would be based on uh, stories that people have told because the two uh, encounters that, that I've had, of course, my husband had an encounter and in, <clears throat> in North Carolina, but, um, um, I would have to base my my feelings on the subject on what other people have told me. I don't see a evidence of culture like some people try to say that they're human. And oh my God, when I say that, then I know we'll get all sorts of comments. But uh, and people can believe what they want to believe. I don't discount other people's beliefs. If they want to believe a certain way, that's fine. But I have I have the right to disagree with that. So I think that Bigfoot is a, a bipedal ape. That's what I think. And there's evidence through uh, the uh, history and fossilization that uh, we did have bipedal apes in the past that didn't figure into human evolution. So uh, I, I, I think we said, I think we see enough through reports, you know, of people witnessing groups and stuff I've seen in my own field work. I'm sure Chuck, you have too. That indicates, you know, there are some, they do have group structure, you know, they have alphas uh, and the sub, sub individuals in the group. And then the juveniles are probably used as sentries. And we see lots of examples of that. So there is some group structure um, and, you know, there are communications, but um, as far as specific language, you know, I, I don't think they have that because... Then you're talking about something that would be uniform from one region to the next, like it is in human populations, and and it isn't. It's they all make what similar. Don't a living. Yeah, they all they all make similar noises, but it's group specific things, like it would be among chimps. No, oh, it's just like any any primate. I mean, all monkey groups they have sounds, and 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 there even there's even universal sounds between all primates. That the you know like and I've said this before, like the babies, the calls that babies make, uh, they make a fairly distinctive sound even whether they're a gorilla a chimpanzee or a, a macaque or whatever all of them make this little you know hoo hoo, and then the screech sound when they're calling for their mothers and and of course it's going to vary the different sounds obviously a gorilla is not going to make the same type of sound as as a macaque would because you've got the different uh, uh size variations there but you know there's there's a hierarchical structure within the groups that you know just like what you said with the alpha males and the betas and and uh i'm sure it's all primates have that they all have a social structure and uh but as far as culture 
I mean, you're getting into an entirely different thing. So, um, and I don't even know if, you know, like what we discussed with the fire pits, I, I, I don't even, I don't even know if you really could refer to that as a, a cultural thing. Yeah, I, I don't uh, think so. Uh, uh, that's more like tool it falls in the tool use category. Right. Okay, I can build a fire. I can use a, a stick to pull out termites or ants or whatever, you know. But uh, <clears throat> no culture, I don't think so. Uh. Uh-uh. So we're not going to find a Bigfoot burial ground with like cave paintings eventually. Not likely, no. Well, I don't, I don't know. Maybe we could, but I mean, I, I don't. I've never heard of anybody finding anything like that. Right, burials are possible, but again, you're right. You know, finding it that's a whole different matter. Well, guys, I mean, and gonna... I think I discussed. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, um, she, go ahead. I, I'm just going to interject this thing in there too. That I think I said this once before. Now we were talking about burials. Um, when. I've had horse mares deliver babies that uh, were born dead, okay? I was told by a vet, I did not know this, and all the years that I had been with horses, I did not know this, but my vet told me, no, leave the baby in there at least for 24 hours with the mare so she can she can mourn and she can realize that that baby's dead. And he said, you'll find that they'll be a very unique thing. And he didn't tell me what that unique thing was, but I figured it out real quick. They bury the baby. They cover the baby up. And once they do that, they realize that the baby is dead. And I thought, you know, maybe Bigfoot do the same thing, and it's not really a cultural thing. It's just something that they do, you know, I don't know whether out of necessity or just respect for the other animal. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, it's an instinctual thing. That's a good point. Well, we're just about out of time, guys. Um, anybody have any final thoughts, comments, questions? I, my final thought is, you know, you better have baked beans available if the Bigfoot's going to come into your house, because apparently there's like pinto beans that they'll smack you in the head with them. And the can opener. Don't forget the can opener. Oh, it's yeah. can opener. <laughs> and the cornbread. That's right. Uh, and the Good point, Chuck. Good point. <laughs> and some Febreze. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's william, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.